Consider this before viewing the Holocaust in memory of millions, part one. Discuss what you already know about the Nazis and their persecution of millions. Have you ever met a survivor of the Holocaust? What were some of his or her memories of the experience? As you watch, note the personal accounts of World War II and think about how their stories affect your understanding of the Holocaust. Assignment Discovery now presents The Holocaust in Memory of Millions, Part 1. For not only are we responsible for the memories of the dead, we are also responsible for what we are doing with those memories. I'm Walter Cronkite, and this is the Hall of Witness of the new United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. This extraordinary place is charged with a mission, a mission to preserve for future generations the memory of the millions who died and the countless others who suffered by servants of a diabolic ideology. The German Third Reich, under Chancellor Adolf Hitler, persecuted and arbitrarily murdered those who could not or would not meet the standards of the Nazi party. Those who died included Jews, Jehovah's Witnesses, Gypsies, communists, homosexuals, the physically or mentally handicapped. From the film archives, we'll review the images that document this ghastly period. Some of the material in this program is very painful to watch. child, I was growing up in a Jewish surrounding, quite happy. I was uh, attending school, and it was a normal pre-war life. There were many Jewish businesses, many Jewish enterprises. Uh, there were several very large and important synagogues. Our community was mostly a Jewish community because we was mixed with the Polish people. All the people of every religion lived nicely together. I did not know any really hatred or prejudice as a child. As soon as the Nazis came to power, it was, uh, there was it, as though a blanket of fear, a heavy blanket of fear descended on us. We were afraid to go places, we were afraid, this is the places that we had been to before. I lived in virtually constant fear every single day that some of the Hitler Youth boys would try and beat us up and would uh, lie in wait behind some building that uh, we may not have been uh, alerted to previously and, and they were much bigger than we were and uh, just beat us with impunity because certainly nobody was going to stop them. The Jews were dismissed from the civil service. They gradually lost positions as leading employees. They were ousted from the cultural world. 
And by and by, they found that simply being able to support oneself was becoming progressively more difficult. Book burnings and the like were simply part and parcel of a movement which was designed to make Germans think alike, march to the same drummer, with the same rhythm, and in the same direction. There was to be no deflection from the aim of the Nazi party. There was a, a continuous blaring of loudspeakers. You always hear his uh, voice shouting, screaming. But that's what it was really like. I remember him coming to in a motorcade going down the street and you could hear all this and I saw him. So this was real. 1938 represents a tightening of the screws. I remember Kristallnacht very vividly because I got up and there was a kind of an eerie uh, silence outside. Then suddenly somebody screamed, look at the uh, smoke, there's a synagogue burning. There did come a time in 1938 and in 1939 when people very desperate to leave Germany could not do so. Or if they were able to leave at all, they chose any place where they could possibly be accepted. I remember our last Passover dinner of 1941, where we were together with cousins, a grandmother, parents. After that, the Nazis took us over and we were not together anymore. The Einsatzgruppen actually were the killing squads. Those were special units that were sent in to do the job to kill the people, to kill the Jewish and other victims that suffered, organize the ghettos, do the deportations. Those were the units that were in charge on the Jewish problem. This is really when I, at the age of 13, realized that there was hatred in this world, that the Holocaust was happening to us in Shaulai, Lithuania. The ghetto was made in the outskirts of the city, by the time the ghetto was formed, half, almost half, of our 10,000 Jewish people of the city of Shaolai were killed in those graves. The first two years in the ghetto meant hunger and fear. Fear for my life, because every single day, SS and Gestapo used to run through the ghetto. Sometimes they looked for healthy, sometimes for sick, sometimes for children. You were never secure. Every family in the ghetto had a tiny little hiding place where the children used to hide when they saw that SS and Gestapo were running to grab people. I remember many selections, especially in, in hanging in the ghetto, I remember very well. Also, what I remember very distinctly is a special, special day that I'll never forget in my life, November 5th, 1943. I was 15 and a half years old. I had my job that morning when I got to the gate to go out to work. I saw many, many trucks. All day long we wondered, what were these trucks doing near the ghetto? Were they delivering something or taking someone out? That evening, when we came back from work, blocks and blocks away from the ghetto, we had cries, such cries, I hope no human beings will hear again. What happened in the ghetto of Shaolai, Lithuania, 
on November 5, 1943. SS and Gestapo, with the help of Ukrainian soldiers that ran away from the Russian army, I ask again, why do people join evil causes? They ran through the ghetto. They found every single person. Everyone was ordered to the big place near the gate. And at the gate, one assessment with a point of the thumb to the right and to the left. Is it up to one person to decide somebody else's fate, who shall live and who shall die? A thousand beautiful children through the age of 14, 500 elderly and sick, and a few hundred healthy and strong. That was their day off from work. They were pushed into the trucks and they were taken away. The life in the ghetto after the children's selection was terrible. No laughter, no crying of children. No one should know a place where there are no children. with barbed wires, with police, German police, with the Gestapo. And we got no connection, no help from outside. Till 1942, we got schools for the children. We got theater. We got uh, concerts. So was the culture life was a normal culture life in the ghetto. Because uh, we was young people. We was locked up in the ghetto and we still want to live. Now, besides this, we got our administration, from uh, housing to uh, health department to hospitals. We got everything organized for ourselves in the ghetto. Matter of fact, we got all, also the money printed special for us. We got our post office for us. We have three bridges in the ghetto where they connect from one section to the other section, because through the ghetto went a train, and the train was for Polish people to go from one part of Lodz to the other part. But we Jews, if we want to go from one section to the other section, we use the bridge. The German uh, want us to uh, produce for the German army, so we got organized like a factory, like a shoe factory. The ghetto produce one soldier every minute. This means from the shoes to the helm, every minute. You work 12 hours a day, you got one meal a day. We have only one way to go to Auschwitz or to Helmdo or to stay here in, in, and uh, produce. Don't forget, when you are hungry, you produce. The most people die from hunger. And later we got typhus. More than 150 deaths a day. And we got only four wagons to take away the deaths. You know, this was very bad. If you walk in the street, you go to work and you see a dead person, so you look on your, this is maybe your parents or something, and you walk by. Every few months, the German give an order, they need 5,000 people to take. So it was a big uh, trouble because they started to look for people who don't have jobs. Every time when the German want to take away people, they shut them on the spot. They call down the people and whoever they don't like him or if they move, you got this every time. Shutting. The same thing if you walk too close to the barbed wires. The German don't give you a warning. They shut you on the spot. This you got a normal life in the ghetto to be shot. But don't forget, they break up families. They take away, and we don't know where they go. We were sure they go to some uh, camps to work. But later we find out they went to Helmno, where they killed them. And when the ghetto was smaller, less people, they brought people like from Czechoslovakia, from Hungary, 
from uh, Vienna, even from Luxembourg, they brought people, new, new blood to work for them. Don't forget one thing, the eldest of the Jews in Lodz, Chaim Rukotsky, his idea was if we produce for the German, we survive. In the end, it was working out different. was a life with activities, with hope, with dignity, and also thinking how to survive, but to survive as a people. To survive, not to be degraded. I was connected with an illegal cultural group and political group from the former youth organization, we continued some illegal activities in the ghetto. In the beginning, the resistance was in the ghettos by creating illegal school, by creating the public soup kitchens, by creating the committees, the house committees, to relieve the starvation. Later on, the resistance took the forms of physical and collective resistance. The fighters' organization got the trust of the people in the ghetto. And they worked together. And when they gave orders in bulletins that the Jews have to build some hiding places, bunkers, when deportation comes, they have to resist. The arrow struck the 19th of April, 1943. At that time, I was on the police side on, my, on assignment. And when the German came in into the ghetto in the morning, as a group with tanks, the streets were empty. When they came to certain uh, intersections, they were greeted by grenades and by Molotov cocktails and by shots. They didn't expect the Jews would be so organized. The Germans withdrew from the ghetto. And the second day they came with tanks, but the battle went on. The Germans started to burn the ghetto, block after block and house after house was set on fire. We looked for ways and for me is how to get in, how to help, how to be with our people. Because the whole world now is at, on end. We didn't think that we are going to succeed, but a deep conviction that our action is just drove us on. And the symbol of it was that if we have to die, and we knew that we are going to die, we want to choose our own death. Ever since I was a child of six years, I was running away from the Nazis. And Le Chambon was one of the places where I found a haven. When I arrived, I was uh, immediately asked to join the uh, family of the uh, pastor of the village, André Trocmé and to take care of their children. I was received very warmly and was part of the family. I joined uh, the Trokme family and I was asked if I could join one of the houses where they 
would bring the children from concentration camps, and I taught them French. And uh, the community understood that the children were in danger as the war uh, went on, uh, and they knew that they were being sent to extermination camps. And uh, in order to help prevent that, they organized escape routes to uh, Switzerland. The, the c uh, community completely ignored the danger they put themselves uh, into. <laughs> Jews have been an integral part of the Danish society for more than 300 years. Uh, you wouldn't distinguish between Jews and non-Jews in, in, in Denmark. I know the terms used uh, Danish Jews, but rather one should say Jewish Danes. There was no Jewish question in Denmark. The Danish government, the Danish king, the Danish population wouldn't allow any Jewish question to be raised by the Germans. But when the Danish government, at the end of uh, August 1943, decided to stop in any form of cooperation with the German occupation force, uh, then we knew something was going to happen. Late in September, my dad came home early and told us, told the family, that my, that's my mother and my sister and my brother, that we should get ready to leave the flat as soon as in any way possible. We couldn't bring any luggage whatsoever, but we should put on warm clothes because um, the Germans were after us and we had to get out of the country. We had to try to go to Sweden. We boarded the ship, the 17 um, refugees. Uh, it was an old fishing vessel. We were put down in the hold. I remember very clearly waking up the ship moving very unpleasantly. And later on, I was told by, by my parents that the young skippers on board had decided that they couldn't outrun the German patrol boats, but they took the risk of running into a big minefield, hoping that the shallowness of the fishing vessel would keep us safe, which it did, and it did stop the German patrol boats from pursuing us. The skippers were very inexperienced, but idealists. They had never run a boat before, but they had been given instructions. And we made it to Sweden. When we look at what happened, more than 90% of the uh, small Jewish community in Denmark, consisting of about 7, 000, 7 to 8,000 people, were rescued. Uh, one must realize, of course, that basically, uh, I know it's been called, uh, it's been termed a miracle, but, but basically it was a question of Danes helping fellow Danes in a time of need. Now that you've seen the Holocaust in memory of millions, part one, talk about this. According to the program, it took less than three months for Hitler to seize total power. What allowed Hitler and the Nazi party to obtain power in Germany so quickly? Describe the role that propaganda played in manipulating the thoughts and actions of the German people. Now try this. Imagine that you've just avoided persecution by the Nazi army. Write a short story detailing your narrow escape. Include descriptions of your secret hiding places, the food you ate, and the people who helped pave your path to freedom. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to support the Holocaust in memory of millions. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests The Hidden Children by Jane Marks. Consider this before viewing The Holocaust in Memory of Millions, Part 2. 
Just over a half century has passed since Allied troops began to liberate the Nazi concentration camps. Wounds still run deep, and the threat of similar tragedies looms around the world. As you watch, listen to survivors and the Allied soldiers who witnessed the Nazi atrocities. How can their stories help to stop another Holocaust from occurring? Assignment Discovery now presents The Holocaust in Memory of Millions, Part 2. Able to find refuge from the persecutions of Nazi Germany or from the deprivations of the ghettos, there was another way out, a one-way trip to one of the thousands of slave labor concentration and death camps established by the Nazi government. Millions made that journey. It was necessary to mobilize the German transport system, notably in this case the railways, to assure that one-way traffic one had to solve rather difficult problems of financing this operation in as much as there was no budget for destruction. In other words, the victim themselves, the victims themselves had to pay for this transport, albeit mostly by indirect means. We were told that within a few days we'd have to be ready for resettlement in Poland. Of course, uh, resettlement meant different things to different people. The Nazis knew they were going to kill us. My parents were hoping no one, uh, this would not happen, that somehow we were able to, would be able to escape. Uh, and of course we were children and we were hope, we just thought, well, this would not uh, happen to us. I took my mother and uh, we went to the railroad station, what it was special built for the Lodge ghetto. And we believe that we go to another camp like they, like the German promised us. The morning of the day where we were ready to, were told to get ready, I woke up early before the sun came up and I was just hoping I would find a way to make the sun stop to, from rising. If I, only I could be out there and hold the sun back and tell it not to rise that day so that the day would never come and it would always be the day before. They lined us up for a march to the railroad station. The railroad station in my city was bombed already, so we had to walk I don't know how many kilometers. We came to the station and there we saw the big box cars. No windows, nothing. Big doors opened up. They shoved us into those cars. They didn't count how many. Uh, they are, those are called kettle cars. Why are they called kettle cars? That were used to transport cattle, cows and horses. Uh, screaming, you heard screaming from the minute what you went out from the, from the uh, kettle cars. You went out and heard screaming and, uh, because the Gestapo was in the SS was hitting, beating, shutting like, uh, like animals. Yeah, this was, uh, we were scary, we don't know what happened. I remember it was so crowded, no food, a little bit of bread that we took along from the ghetto, no water, a bucket in the corner for sanitation purposes. It was a horrible journey. We traveled three, four days. When we arrived at the station, this lady we find out is Auschwitz, Auschwitzim, and we saw people in zebra uh, clothing. We don't understand what this is. And the lady, we saw the SS open the doors from the kettle cars. And they start to yell everybody out, out. All the women left, the men right. So you don't know what to do with your mother. Your mother is here. You work, you're in what's really a hell. This moment, 
I never, never forget. It took us about seven or eight days to get into Auschwitz, and we arrived on the train landing, the same platform, I guess, that all the others came on. And again, we were greeted by these Nazis with their shining boots and their beautifully dressed uniforms and their white gloves and the dogs and the whips and a lot of shouting and pushing and kicking. And we never, I never saw my father again. I know he had been on the train for all these days, but they kept us all separated, and they, uh, I never saw him after that, uh, after we got on the train in Frankfurt. As soon as we arrived in Stutthof, our little bundles were taken away from us. They told us, put it away, you'll come back and take it later. Next thing, one man with the point of the thumb, to the right, to the left. My brother was sent to the men's camp. My mom, who was at that time uh, 46, she was sent to that, to the left. I found myself at the age of 16, all alone. At a holiday resort near Ebensee, a stroll in the fresh mountain air was rejuvenating. Life was peaceful for the vacationing Germans. The air was clean, the sun warm. For the prisoners of Dachau and Buchenwald a few miles away, the view from behind barbed wire was not so picturesque, and their visit offered no recuperation, rather starvation, disease, slave labor. My group of women were taken into a very large room where we were told to strip completely naked. Traumatic experience for a child of 16. The Nazis standing around us, beating upon us, chasing us from one end to the room to the other. We had our, we were waiting for our numbers to be tattooed and we stood in line. And of course I was frightened and I called for my mother and I heard her voice in back of me and by then her hair had been shaved, and all our hair had been shaved. I turned around and I looked for her, and I couldn't recognize her because, I mean, without hair. We were given clothes and that were probably recycled, just taken off a corpse and just given to us, and then we were expected to die too, so then they would take the clothes and give to someone else. In other words, the clothes were much more valuable than human beings. My family was taken away, my clothing was taken away, my bundles were taken away. But I had one more precious thing. We all take it for granted, our names. A beautiful name, Nessa Galperin. I became prisoner 54,015 in the concentration camp of Stutthof. In Auschwitz was starving. But uh, this ration was for starving. And besides, thing, when you were out to work, you, you got beaten. The SS behaved so that's how more people they could kill. This was the idea. Then you was not a person. You become so numb. You just pray to God that they shouldn't kill you the next day. And you just worry how you're going to survive that day or that hour. That's all you think of. You think of food and life. We were given soup, so-called soup that was made of uh, uh, turnips and potato peels and some water and once in a while a crinkly piece of meat sort of floating in there. And sometimes just uh, bags were emptied into the soup. So at one time I remember we found uh, combs and lipstick and um, I think uh, all kinds of toilet articles cooked in the soup. There were latrines which were just holes in the ground with a plank of wood over it. And sometimes we were not even allowed to go onto the latrines and we had to use our own, the, the, the soup dishes that we were given and clean them out and uh, use them again. In the morning, they woke you up real, real early and they counted you. They made you roll call. You stood there for hours, it was called a pill. You stood there, they counted you and counted you. Why count you? There was no place to escape. You were surrounded with two rows of electric wires, guards around and around. After counting us and giving us the little food, 
They chased us to do different jobs. Every day you did so. They took, let's say, 50 women, 100 women. You go sweep the, the street. You go clean the bathrooms. You go do this. You go do that. And it was all kind of work. It was uh, digging holes. Uh, some, like I was working later on digging uh, pits. But later we found out what we are doing. That this is pits for people who they get them and the crematorium could not burn. So they brought here hundreds and hundreds of uh, bodies and later was, uh, they burned them. So this was the work. We had to do all this digging and had to dig here and then fill the, in the hole and dig a hole next to it. I think this was purposely designed to demoralize us and to uh, sap our energy. One day I was taken out with 50 women to a courtyard where we were told to assort shoes. There was a pile, a mountain of shoes. From the other side there was a Polish prisoner of war camp and the Polish prisoner said to us, Jewish ladies, do you know what these shoes are? Those are the shoes from your people that were killed in this camp, that were taken in this gas chamber and crematoria. The sight is was terrible when you was looking in the evening and you saw the fire over the chimneys. And you know in the beginning, the first days you start to ask, what is this fire? So they say, oh, this is nothing. They burn you clothing, what you they don't want. Later you find out, somebody say, oh, you know your parents, your brother, your sister, your child. This way they are burning. This was the, the, the fire from the uh, crematorium. The crematorium were going day and night. These gas chambers were going day and night. At, during the day, the, um, there was just black smoke coming out that you saw. And uh, when the wind was in the direction of the camp, it min the ashes fell down mixed with uh, small splinters of bone. And that mixed into the soil. So to me, this is a consecrated earth. This is not something that's uh, just some soil. It was really a holy ground. The, the Nazis were Germans, and their effectiveness is derived from the fact that they were extremely well trained, extremely well educated for the job that each was assigned. Moreover, the people who were running this organization were extremely cognizant of what was necessary to undertake action that would in ultimate ways be totally effective. One doesn't build a concentration camp without materials, without condemnation proceedings, without getting supplies, without architects, without engineers. All of these people are needed to accomplish the final result. It was accomplished. camps were shut down long before the arrival of the Red Army and there the Germans had time to manicure the grounds a little bit and to try, if not totally successfully, to erase traces of killing centers that had been established in these locations. But not only was it the question of destroying the buildings or other facilities but also of what to do with the labor force that was in these camps that had not been gassed and which had to be marched out over long distances to some other place. In the January of 1945, one morning, we, as we were lined up in the morning, we were again given our little bread and our little whatever, and we were told we are leaving the camp. We didn't know what was going on, but now we realized that the Germans were retreating from the area, and the SS and the Gestapo didn't leave the evidence behind. We were the evidence of their crimes. So they lined us up and marched us. We marched through the cities and villages from 
the area that was Poland into Germany. You know, now people say they didn't see, they didn't hear, they didn't know. It was visible. We saw many, many human beings with a bullet in the back, face down in the snow. So we knew that that same road, many camps marched before us. The late Sidney Bernstein, the founder of Granada Television in Britain, was a member of the Allied forces that liberated the concentration camps. He was determined to record on film the inhumanity the liberators found so that the atrocities could never be denied. In the spring of 1945, the Allies advancing into the heart of Germany came to Bergen-Belsen. Neat and tidy orchards, well-stocked farms lined the wayside and the British soldier did not fail to admire the place and its inhabitants. At least until he began to feel a smell. It came from a concentration camp, a waste ringed with barbed wire and overlooked by watchtowers. Coming in from the flowering countryside in spite of the frightful smell, things didn't seem so bad at first. Children smiled through the barbed wire and women laughed and waved their hands. But Belsen Camp was vast, and inside was a different story. I'm at present in Belsen Camp doing guard duty over the SS men. The things in this camp are beyond describing. When you actually see them for yourself, you know what you're fighting for here. Pictured in the paper, cannot describe it at all. We actually know now what has been going on in these camps. And I know personally what I am fighting for. Look like a castle the smart housing, and um, the uh, walls were 10 foot high, there were electrified fences to keep the inmates from trying to get out, and some of them were so weak they couldn't get out even if they it didn't have guards, they couldn't, uh, they were starving to death. We'd heard rumors that there were concentration camps, that there were prisoners there, uh, but we didn't expect to see human skeletons, and we still can't fathom how people could look so thin and be alive. The people that were able to just hugged us and kissed us, their faces were uh, thin and, and haggard from lack of food. In most cases, they were all starving. Most of the people seemed to be listless, beyond hope and astonishment. Hunger had probably affected them that way. We discovered that among the stench of disease and decay was something a bit worse than hunger. Moving vaguely on rickety skeleton legs, they were too ill to eat. How grateful they were for a kindly word or gesture. What misery to live among such unmentionable filth, with scarcely the strength to pick the lice which inevitably swarmed all over them. Those who were still living were being attended to. Supplies of hot soup were prepared, and those who could eat unaided were fed as quickly as possible. And every soldier's stock of food was called into use. Water too had been cut off, so the water cart was the most important thing to arrive. When we got there, the people had been starved so long without food, they were dying daily. Uh, and uh, we gave them soup and, uh, you know, made, made uh, liquid diets for them because they couldn't eat a solid food. There had been no water supply for six days. The Germans pleaded it had been cut. We laid on water in a few hours and before 12 hours had passed had sufficient to enable them to wash. We uh, moved them out to the hospital tents that we had set up in a field some distance away and uh, the worst ones were being taken care of there and gradually the death rate st to went to a couple dozen a day and then finally one or two a day and that was about it. 
it's very strange. I was used to roll call, and uh, we went, we got up, and there was no roll call. We sort of felt aimless. We sort of felt, um, what are we going to do with all this freedom? This is this is so good, but how do you handle it all at once? Didn't take us very long to figure it out, but uh, it, we were. Uh, I think it's just that we were so depressed and so. Uh, I just felt so so uh, hopeless that suddenly this this whole hope opening up was just a little bit difficult to assimilate. It took a little bit of time. He was thinking you are free, a free way you ever think to a bird go out from the cage, how she fly free, this how was with us. We was jumping, we could not walk much, but we were jumping in the place, each one was kissing. Look, now somebody started to yell, where's my mother, where's my father? Now start the tragedy. To see the horror alongside of you and to look out over the God's beautiful world and man's inhumanity to man alongside of you, it was uh, just mind-boggling. You, you, you couldn't fathom how beautiful and how ugly it can be all in one area, in one place, at one time. <laughs> This place sacred to memory, this museum in America stands as an eternal witness to the Holocaust. It also stands for resistance to evil and the enshrinement of that which is good in the human spirit. How is it that man's silence was matched by God's? Oh, I don't believe there are answers. There are no answers, and this museum is not an answer. It is a question mark. If there is a response, it is a response in responsibility. This building tells the story of events that human eyes should never have seen once. But having been seen, must never be forgotten. Our eyes will always see. Our hearts will always feel. But it is not sufficient to remember the past. We must learn from it. watching discussion questions activities and resources for the holocaust in memory of millions are up next on assignment discovery Now that you've seen The Holocaust in Memory of Millions, Part 2, talk about this. Discuss the meaning of the Holocaust Memorial inscription, We Must Bear Witness. What do you think is the better way to understand the Holocaust? By learning historic facts or by hearing survivor stories? Explain your response. Why do you think it is important to bear witness to the horrors of the Holocaust? Now try this. Imagine you are holding an international summit of world leaders on how to promote racial understanding and harmony. Develop five specific steps world leaders could take to prevent further atrocities like the Holocaust. Log on to discoveryschool.com for curriculum materials and resources to support the Holocaust in memory of millions. To learn more, Assignment Discovery suggests Children in the Holocaust and World War II. Edited by Laurel Holiday.
The preceding program is part of Cable in the Classroom, a free service of the cable communications industry and your local cable company.
Tomorrow on Assignment Discovery's Milestones of the 20th Century Week, learn the history behind the Civil Rights Movement and discover the struggles to be free at last. Experience the turmoil in the 1960s in the United States. Travel to Mississippi and watch thousands join together in the struggle for racial equality. Finally, see how justice is served for the martyrs of this cause. That's tomorrow on Assignment Discovery.